In June, the solar tracker powerhouse Next Tracker acquired Ojo, a company specializing in foundation technology and services. And today in the pitch, we have Saul Hudson and Charles Almy from Next Tracker here to dig deeper, pun intended, on the importance of solar tracker foundations and how innovations here can lead to more solar everywhere. It's interesting to me how much of my conversations about solar trackers, which seemingly differentiate themselves based on, you know, tracking mechanisms and algorithms and all that, how often those conversations lead back to just the foundations, you know, the connection to the ground. Why are we focusing on tracker foundations still today? Foundations have, of course, always been a critical part of utility scale solar. And, and what we're seeing today, right, as you think about the diversity of terrain conditions, soil conditions that projects are being built on today, uh, you know, extreme variability in soil conditions, ground conditions, that the significant portion of project risk uh, is actually on the back of the, the geotech conditions, the soil conditions that, uh, that underpin uh, the project locations and, and the projects themselves. So tremendous opportunity to leverage innovation and technology to address those soil variabilities and, and essentially squeeze out uh, risk and uncertainty in project development and construction. And so, uh, Charles, Ojo's patented foundations are now part of the Next Tracker portfolio. And I was hoping you could explain, you know, what is different about the Ojo Foundation and kind of what it brings to the Next Tracker. The Ojo Foundation is actually a, a trust foundation. So it's two. It's two screws that go into the ground. One thing we realized pretty quickly is the majority of the loads on a tracker are lateral. So uh, you have lateral and then you have moment from stowing. The best way to resist that is not a stick in the ground, right? It's to, to have a, a splayed stance, right? If you just stand with your legs spread apart, you can figure that out. The other thing that we, we kind of noticed, uh, it's typical to have three different crews come through to do your, your harder site. So you have to have a pre-drill uh, rig, you have the pile driver, and then you have to remediate it to get it right. And so we wanted to do everything. Our focus was one machine gets it done with one crew. And when they're done, the foundation is complete. So we drill and drive directly into the soil at the same time with the, with the machine. Our screws are hollow, so you can put the drill bit through uh, and drill ahead while you're actually driving the screw. So it's not just the actual uh hardware the foundation itself it's the whole process that yes. is a part of it okay very cool can you go into some of the examples of ground conditions that maybe some of our audience have you know encountered in the past that they've maybe ruled out or avoided or knew that they were going to encounter a lot of refusals or whatever the case may be yeah. that you feel like you're more, maybe more confidently installing on uh, with how you with your process and your your technology the the kind of conditions that we've seen a lot of, um, I think some EPCs are probably familiar with the term caliche, uh, just it's it's pretty hard, uh, kind of like a concrete, it's like natural concrete uh, that occurs. Uh, that that has been uh, really good to Ojo and really terrible to anybody who's trying to install H-Pile. We've also uh, installed in a lot of basalt uh, in, in, you know, kind of more volcanic areas like Oregon. In Texas, you have a gradient of uh, clay over limestone, or uh, you know, in the West, you have more caliche uh, as well. So we've seen a, a, a big variety. Uh, but one thing I do want to point out that's important: it's not like you get a site and it's all one thing. Uh, that's a that's a really big deal to EPCs. Is there's this kind of risk and uncertainty, and you get a geotech, and it might not be 100% uh, reliable, and you might want to uh, have a technology that's flexible enough to be able to handle some soft spots and some hard spots. And that's where Ojo comes in. We're really focusing on what I like to say is either end of the geotech spectrum, right? Where where Ojo and the solution that, that Charles has been describing is really focused on hard, rocky, you know, caliche, basalt, et cetera, those types of conditions that would typically require pre-drilling. Uh, so that's one end of the geotech spectrum. And then on the other end of the geotech spectrum, you have very soft, weak soils, uh, expansive soils, whether that's expansive clay or frost heave type conditions. Um, so the industry have has challenges on on either end of, of that geotech spectrum. On the soft soils, we have NX Anchor, which is a, 
a, a neck tracker solution for for those soft, weak, expansive soil conditions. Given what you just said, it is is there just like more of the market open to next tracker now i mean obviously you guys are like an industry leader were you avoiding these sites or were you pursuing them but it was just like a you know a big pain before next tracker has been installing in all these this is mostly a pain alleviation technique for the epcs and and really cost reduction because it's significantly less steel it also opens up siting options earlier from a developer perspective as well as they're looking at securing land to eventually site a project on, they may on first filter early in their, their land selection may, may skip locations that, that they know have got challenging soil conditions. There's a very extensive, uh, very long interconnection queue across the U S and in increasing the, the, the land area that you can cost effectively build solar on and it opens up opportunity to site solar closer to interconnection uh, where where you may not have been been able to previously. You mentioned at one point there, you know, the terrain following, you know, that's a, a buzz term in uh, trackers these days, um, which in my mind is, you know, it's about the north, south rolling hills, building with articulation. I guess I don't think about the foundations again, when like totally like when it comes to that. So what, 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 what role do foundations play in executing like a terrain following like tracker design? In a way, we're kind of expanding the definition of what terrain following means to include topographic, but also geotechnical conditions, right? So reveal window is, is something really important to the project engineers of EPCs. And that is how, how much variation can you have on your H piles or the, the basically the, the torque tube height above ground at any location. And with H piles, you have a very narrow reveal window with any sort of anchor system where you have uh, you know, a, a, a triangle, whether it be anchor or the Ojo solution, uh, you, you you get penalized a lot less for going high. So what we have is a much bigger reveal window, which allows us to go over things that we previously couldn't do. Chris, you mentioned the the rolling hill nature of terrain following, but what Charles just touched on that that, that in a very narrow topography uh, along a row, you may have a you know only a five foot wide section that is a wash and you need to place a pile there in order to, to maintain your tracker row and, and to build on BLM land, you know, there, there oftentimes a requirement to, to not cut and fill and to leave those washes as they are. So, you know, even, you know, a terrain following tracker may not be sufficient to be able to manage that very, very narrow, deep and steep wash situation where, you know, the Ojo Solutions example certainly can. Reducing and removing grading from projects is a is a big deal. Um, and uh, you, I guess you guys already touched on it, but is there, any, is there any more to say about how what we're doing now with, with foundation innovation is how much we've reduced grading? Like, are, are you pretty much, can you just get away with not doing it at all? In a lot of BLM jobs, it's starting to be zero grading requirement. So that, that's a really tough thing for an EPC, right? Uh, they they get they get a piece of land that are told to put as much solar as they can on it, and uh, you know if you don't if you can't do any grading, it makes it very difficult. So we talked about terrain following. So that's you know bending the torque tube um, such that you follow the contours uh, within your reveal window. It's additive to this foundation's uh, solution where you have a very big reveal window. Now you can do both. So you can imagine that you can you can bend the torque tube up to a degree and a half. And you have this five foot reveal window, it, it really makes it so that you can go over very, very significant topography without doing any grading at all. So I was wondering if there are other environmental considerations too, like uh, with an agrivoltaics project, for example, uh, on a farm, are there, uh, is there anything in terms of the approach to foundations there or, you know, the reveal window you're talking about that are advantages on projects like that? Another requirement that we're seeing is uh, uh, maximum numbers of of times you can track over the same spot. Uh, this is to kind of, you know, if grading is like a macro soil disturbance, right? You're taking away huge chunks. There's also a limits now on the micro uh, topography on the top. It's, it's, it's a, you know, environmental uh, requirement now that you only track over it a certain amount of times while building your tracker. So you don't disturb the topsoil. Oh, okay. Yeah, which makes it very difficult for an EPC, right? So they have to look at it and they're like, okay, so I got, 
I've got a foot of, of topsoil, then I have caliche, and they're letting me only track through there four times or whatever. If you if you have to do your uh, pre-drill, uh, pile driver, and remediation, you've just eat, eaten up four of them before you even start building the rest of the top. So it's it's kind of it, it's kind of nice to be able to do it all in one pass with one machine, just bang it all out. You know, being being light on on land and reducing the number of passes across the site that that also alleviates compaction of the topsoil mm -hmm. and and the, the whole grading cut and fill topic of course is about not disturbing the topsoil so if you're if you're able to avoid disturbing the topsoil able to reduce the compaction impact of having multiple passes you can a lot of times leave native vegetation ground cover in place you know, now that we know we can do these things, are timelines getting shortened or just, you know, what else is happening that's like innovating in terms of process? If you think about how traditionally this is done, you, you either sub out or you do these H piles and you get that done. And there's some interface to be able to handle the lack of tolerance of those H piles. And then you bring your, your tracker and you put it on top of that. And so there's that that's like kind of an, an interface that maybe is not optimized now we have the ability to do that to optimize those two things so now when you buy a foundation or you buy you know a tracker you buy a foundation you bet getting them all from next tracker you're guaranteed that that's all going to work and be lined up perfectly that's going to save you a lot of time in the long term the other thing that i think that we're innovating our way out of is subsurface risk so you know the if the operator or if the i'm sorry the epc comes out and thinks that they, you know, oh, I looked at this, I'm going to give it a, a, a shot with H piles, and then they have problems, uh, then, you know, it really added a bunch of schedule and a bunch of, of, of labor costs to the system. Uh, having something that's kind of like a, a silver bullet is a really nice solution. There's also an important consideration on the front end of, of project engineering, project design, being able to work with one partner that, that will ensure that, you know, pile counts and loads are, are well aligned and considered between the tracker and the foundation um, that you've got one partner to be able to work those details with instead of needing to kind of go back and forth between multiple parties which which is the case if if you if you need to to, to work with a different foundation provider and a different tracker provider you know with a wider variety of solutions available to be considered up front then you can reduce variability and risk kind of through the construction cycle. So, you know, where, where historically it may have been fairly straightforward, you know, okay, it's always H beams and sometimes they're longer, sometimes they're shorter, sometimes they need pre-drilling, sometimes they don't. Okay, great. That's what I'm going to do at the, at the site. Um, there, there's still a, a significant variability that then gets passed down into the construction cycle and into the project cycle and, and a lot of contingency that's needed to be baked into projects. There's a contingency around the cost and the schedule risk that, that those uh, historic approaches bring. So we're able to, to bring, you know, really a, a more optimized foundation, optimized for the specific conditions, soil conditions that exist on the site um, then that solution inherently uh, being tuned to, to the project specific requirements can can really alleviate a lot of the, the schedule cost risk. Ask any APC, you know, of uh, when they had a smooth foundation install versus when they, they didn't and that the risk associated with it. And when they, if you don't get those right, it really sets the tone for the rest of the build, right? It, 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 It'll put you back right away, right from the get-go. And so considering all of this, are uh, suppliers like Next Tracker, are you taking on more responsibility than in previous years in solar deployment or getting involved earlier? Or like just in general, is the relationship between what Next Tracker is providing to an EPC or developer, you know, is that relationship changing? Or and certainly we're getting involved earlier. Uh, and that's a benefit to everybody involved, right? That getting that, getting that alignment on what are the site specific conditions, whether that's terrain, soil and geotech, whether that's that's wind and other environmental factors, flooding, et cetera. The, the, the sooner 
that we get involved, the sooner we can start bringing solutions to, to those unique challenges into the project design. Building solar power plants is, is hard enough, you know, so we're, we're trying to make at least one part of it a little bit simpler. Well, and you've also made it uh, simpler for someone like me to understand that now I have a better foundation in how, uh, where we are with this and tracker technology. And, you know, it's all very exciting because as we said, there's more land opening up um, and, you know, we are just opening up more places to install solar, you know, all good stuff. So uh, Charles and uh, Saul, I want to thank you for taking the time to stop by and make the pitch today. Thanks very much, Chris. Thanks for having us.